Hey guys, so today we are going to talk about crisis management. So let's get into it. Now, crisis management, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that sooner or later, you're gonna have a crisis. Not a, maybe you've already had a few crises. Personal ones, emotional ones, I don't know. But for the scope of this discussion, we're gonna talk about production outages and how to behave when basically your system goes down and what to do. So, first things first. I will assume a few things because every system is a little bit different and every system needs different considerations when you have a production outage. But for this discussion, we're just going to talk about a web application running in some type of cloud service of some sort with the basic reasonable things that you can expect from a mid-size to, I'll say small size to mid-size, depending on your definition, system. So first things first, you are going to get notified somehow that your website is down or that something for whatever reason is preventing access to the system. That is what per my definition a crisis is. A crisis is not that somebody can click their log, I don't know, their a link or something like that. A crisis is when something is so wrong with your system that your users are prevented from using your core features. So first things first, I can share with you what we do or rather how I myself and my colleagues handle a crisis. First and foremost, we use a communication channel called Slack or you may know about Slack. So the first things first, whoever notif is the f person who discovers or takes in the report that something is a critical failure and basically you are responsible as a team, everybody is responsible to investigate the bug. First person who un can verify that there is actually a crit system critical failure is responsible for creating a Slack channel with a timestamp and a short description of what the issue is and then invite absolutely everybody who is on the development team or the operations team and so forth and notify all these people that this is the situation. You from that point on are what we call the crisis manager or the incident owner. That means that you are now in charge of delegating responsibility to the rest of the team. It's very similar to what the Romans did in times of war one person takes full responsibility and everybody follows that person's lead because if you don't do that everybody's going to run around and do a lot of unnecessary du duplicate work and so forth you need someone who can take quick action and make quick decisions in a crisis so first things first you have a crisis manager that person should now start saying things such as one person goes and checks the logs. We want to know what the scope of this is incident in is. Basically check all the error logs, check how far back this goes, how long have we been down. Second person, you are now responsible for doing a rollback because if you have any type of modern, even remotely modern system, you will have an ability to roll back your system. If you don't, I am sorry for you, then you're screwed. And for the units out there, a rollback is basically what happens when you find that something is wrong with your system, you need to fix it. And unfortunately, the best way for, well, not unfortunately, the best way that you can solve it is by simply re rolling back the, to a previous version when everything was working. Failing that, that, that depends, of course, on if it's a, if you're really unlucky, your issue isn't with, well, your issue isn't with the application itself. That's the way you do a rollback, because let's say that there's a system level bug or an infrastructure level bug. An application, once again, for the juniors, an application level bug is something that's wrong with the code. Somebody pushed a commit or deployed something that wasn't working correctly they caused a regression bug. That's a very easy fix. That's where you, as I said, you just roll back the system and that's the end of it. But if you are really unlucky, and this is why I tell people, you don't know 
how important it is to have proper monitoring, to have logging, to have all of these things in place. Because the, the issue is that these are the, so it's like insurance. Nobody wants to do it, you, nobody wants to invest in it, but when things go wrong, you are screwed if you don't have it. You are completely royally screwed. We had such a very, a very similar issue to that the other day where basically we had an infrastructure level issue and that is very 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 scary there's only one thing that is more scary than an infrastructure level crisis and i'll talk about that one as well and i've faced those as well but infrastructure level issue is that something is wrong with say that you're running everything in containers right something is wrong with your load balancer something is wrong with your reverse proxy or something's wrong with your dns resolution or anything like that this is where the crisis manager needs to and hopefully somebody at, that, at your company has very good understanding of your infrastructure it's very important that you have someone like that ops people are very important ops people are among the most under underappreciated people there is in in it because you don't care about them until something goes wrong and then you're very happy that you have them around trust me so the crisis manager allocates every single operations person to investigate how are what are our metrics are our health checks pinging is everything being resolved correctly that's why the logging is so important that somebody needs to check if the logs are showing any any type of error that's basically the next thing to investigate you do a rollback if you see that there's if, if the issue has to do with the application if it's in and then you if it's not the application itself you go one level up and you check infrastructure has something started going wrong with your DNS resolution, something like that, is something not working at your, in your cloud, etc, etc. And then thirdly, and this is the scary one. Ooh, this is scary. You investigate the load. Load is the scariest damn thing there is, because if, let's say for the sake of argument that for some reason you have an influx of users that is so massive that your system can simply not scale up it does you don't this is what ruby people are most afraid of i suppose where you you get it's a luxury problem i suppose as well but imagine that you for some reason get to a point where the your, your system can simply keep up with the traffic things are going moving too quickly this it doesn't necessarily it's not not it's unfair to ruby to say that this is an issue because there's so many other things that can actually go wrong here so and honestly for the most part it has to do with the database we faced such an issue the other not not that long ago me and my my team where we had been sloppy as you can imagine we had been sloppy with doing indexes for our database so with the increased traffic with a few new features that we had released we actually saw that we that as i said that's a load level problem and that is where as i said you need to have metrics guys you need to know how your system is doing how many requests is it serving how many issues or errors are it, is it reporting connection issues all of this stuff health checks so that's the third level you have a look at at basically that you take a look at what's the load where is the bottleneck usually as i said it's the database unless as i said earlier if it's it on the off chance that you're using a really really slow language it might be that too but it's not so likely anywho if that's the issue the only thing you can do is pray is is to identify where the bottleneck is you have to profile where the issue is and most likely it's going to be the database it's very very rare that it's not something besides the database it can absolutely happen but in general it's the database unless as unless you have an issue with very heavy computations you could have say a really big batch job or something that is sucking away all your memory and your all your containers are failing over and over there are things that could could go wrong there as well but this is something you have to investigate on a case-by-case -case basis. And as I said, just cross your fingers that you have experienced people who know what to do. Because if you have a 
load issue. The quick fix, this is for the juniors as well, the quick fix is to scale up the system, pay more money to have more boxes and hope that that fixes the problem. But as I said, it's a, it's a case by case basis. Can't really give you a good general rule for what to do in all in every single case. But anywho, we have now talked about the, talked about the three levels of investigation that you should do in a crisis. Once the crisis is over, because the first and foremost focus of it for when the crisis hits is that the, the crisis owner needs to resolve the problem as quickly as possible. Everything else stops. So crisis is now averted. That's when you go into the post-mortem or you do a post-mortem. And that is where having good communications and having a person who was in charge of the crisis gets to be very useful. So that person now is responsible for creating a timeline. What is a timeline? Well, a timeline is basically the idea that you, you chalk down all the significant events and all the timestamps, I mean, in other words, the exact, the exact time where each event took place. And then you create the timeline from the very first moment you knew that there was a problem and all the things that happened that were relevant to resolving that problem up until it was resolved. Once that is done, you call a meeting and you and all your colleagues sit down in a meeting and you have a discussion about, all right, what was the impact? How many people this, did this affect? What was the root cause? You do basically the, the person who was the incident owner is responsible for creating this timeline and investigating where the root, what the root cause of the issue was. And then you just walk through the timeline and you discuss, did, how did our crisis, how, how did we handle this crisis? Could we have improved this based on the timeline? Did we do some, everything in the right order? Did we, could we improve something? And then finally you create some action points. And an action point is basically just the idea that, all right, how can we take concrete steps to avoid this happening in the future? And this is, as far as I've found, to be a very effective way of handling a crisis. And then you save the crisis report in your documentation tool. And yeah, that, this is basically it. And I want you to know as well that crises are unavoidable, guys. It's going to happen. The best way to deal with them is, as I said, allocate a single individual who becomes Julius Caesar for the day or until this issue is resolved. And take shards. That's why I argue that it's very important that you spread knowledge so that you don't, it's very important that everybody on your team has a basic, at least a basic understanding of the whole system so that they can become that person, the, the incident owner. Because once the shit hits the fan, you don't have time to sit and talk about who's sick, who's the best. At, like, there's no time, guys. You have to start working immediately. And so having a strategy for dealing with the crisis is a very beneficial thing to have. I hope this was useful. Have a great day.